Hello, wildlings. I'm your creep smith, and you found my fear forge. <laughs> Lucky you. And so we come to the final installment in our less than idyllic interlude, The Tale of Robert Elm, Part 3, by G. Pringle. With my heart thundering, I bolted back to the roof as fast as lightning and hurled myself off. Using my prior climbing skills, I tucked my legs in and rolled across the grass, sustaining only minor bruises. I hoped. I ran around the side of the house, up the stairs, and back into my room just as I heard the great hall open. I heard Lombard's thundering footsteps as he climbed the stairs and approached the door. The door opened, and the giant's eyes met mine. Good to see your evening was a relaxing one, friend. I shrugged and said, ah, I've had better. I had a strange nightmare, really messed with my head. But how did your ritual go, playing dumb with him as best I could? Lombard nodded. All was well. The congregation is eagerly awaiting this Sunday's celebration. Enjoy your rest, friend. I could still see little bits of hastily wiped away viscera clinging to his mask. Lombard shut the door as I heard the rest of the worshippers climbing into the entrance hall. I sat and pondered my situation. I was trapped in this godforsaken place for one more week until they had decided to kill me. I had one week to discover what was really going on and seven short days to plan and execute my escape. The next morning, I woke up early and ran off to the library thinking that it would be a good place to learn some information. It had a wealth of books, everything from war and peace to Pat the Bunny. I wandered the endless shelves until I reached the back corner of the room. All that sat on the last dusty shelf was an old book with a leather cover. Nothing about it caught my eye save for the title, The Book of Sekra. Now remembering the mysterious name from the horror of last night, I snatched up the scripture and scurried out of the library unnoticed. I sat at the desk in my room and flung open the ancient volume. Before me were sprawled mounds of text in Old English. Though it was, in fact, English, it was still difficult to understand as I trudged through the chapters of sacrifice and lore. I found not much beyond useless gibberish about ceremonies, a few of which I recognized. The method in which one is to fasten a goat's head to their own and a full-page print of a slender woman sitting on a throne with what looked like blood spattered around her mouth. Below the picture it read, Sekra in Her Holiness. I returned the book to the library and decided to scour the grounds. Seeing as there was no way I could budge the padlock on the concrete shack, I instead made my way to the chapel. The door slid open easily enough, and inside was what appeared to be a graveyard of old boxes and furniture. After searching for a few hours, I found nothing of interest amongst the stacks of rotting wood. The schoolhouse next door yielded similar results. A few desks in simple rows with a teacher's desk bearing a plaque that had the name Master Lombard, and a chalkboard at the front of the room. Nothing else. Feeling defeated, I emerged from the building when something caught my eye. In the grass at the door of the concrete building sat a shining padlock. My heart leaped into my throat and I sprinted toward the shack. I reached for the iron handle of the door when it suddenly sprang open. A short, stubby man emerged quickly, shutting the door. He noticed me and pushed his back against the door and spoke. Oh, no, 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 boy, don't go in there. This place is not for outsiders. Turn back around, boy, go back to your room, lest I call for the headmaster. I sighed and grudgingly returned to the house. Though I was distraught over this defeat, I returned to my bed and I met sleep with open arms. During the following days, I felt my sanity slipping away as I slowly came to grips with my fate. I stayed in bed most days, refusing to eat and trying to relive as many happy memories as I could before Sunday's inevitable bloodletting. 
several times during my stay, I'd seen people running for the woods, but they were almost immediately apprehended by groups of men clad in red cloaks. I feared the same would happen to me, and I decided to make a run for it. Eventually, pulling myself up on Saturday night, I thought about my situation once more. Clasping my hands together, I contemplated how I could possibly survive. By the time I shut my eyes, I had summoned my last shreds of bravery and constructed a plan with a mental image of the house so I would know my best route out of this place. Shutting my plans away in my head and taking a deep breath, I surrendered to unconsciousness. I rose late Sunday afternoon. Unfitting for one's final day on earth, but the inevitability of death weighed on me and it had kept me in bed. Lombard entered the room around six o'clock. Are you ready to leave us, friend? We're making preparations for the ceremony now. When you're ready, please approach the painting at the other side of the second floor. Slide the painting to the right and it should reveal a staircase. The staircase leads to my chambers. I need to perform the finishing touches for the farewell. I quietly nodded as the door closed. For a few moments, I sat and considered my plans. Sitting, sweating, and breathing heavily, I made my decision. I snatched one of the pencils from the desk drawer and slid it into my right boot. Following the giant's orders, I climbed the hidden staircase and entered a large circular room. The walls were lined with bookcases with a massive desk resting in the center. On the desk sat piles of papers and a typewriter. Moonlight flooded in from the window above it all. Lombard greeted me with a hearty laugh. He told me to remove all of my clothing except for my pants. I obliged and slowly inched toward him as I began unlacing my work boots. My left sock and boots sat on the floor next to me and I began to work on the right. Glancing behind me, I saw Lombard looming in anticipation. I smirked and slowly slid the pencil from my boot. Then, without hesitation, I drove it with all my might into the titan's stomach. Lombard buckled from the strike and dropped to his knees. I heard blood gurgling in his throat. Then I snatched the typewriter from the desk, slid it across as hard as I could, and smashed it into Lombard's face. The headmaster collapsed to the ground in a puddle of his own blood. Turning, I was about to make my way out of the room when I heard quiet laughter emanating from behind me. I spun around to see a bloodied Lombard slowly rising from the carpet. His mask was now distorted and blood-soaked. You, friend, are smarter than the average fool we drag off to this place, he croaked. I gritted my teeth. I'm leaving this place. I know what happened a week ago. Now tell me what really goes on here. Lombard chuckled. As you wish. What I told you about our history that morning was in fact true, though there were a few things I left out to keep you under my thumb. Those two cousins who founded the town are closer to us than you think. One of them was my great-grandfather, the other was yours. Medicine was no longer working to drive away the blight, and my ancestor, great visionary that he was, decided to turn to other means of treatment. He found an old book amongst what he had found sightseeing in the old country. You seem to be familiar with it, which outlined how to give praise to an ancient goddess named Sekra. In exchange for a human life, she would save another. We soon began to use her divine will to save this community. However, your great-grandfather, blinded to reality by his morals, left the village. Just before the birth of his child, he made a vow to Dialis, the brother and polar opposite of the glorious Sekra god of morality and justice, that his bloodline would be forever devoted to the eradication of our order. This whole ordeal has been our effort to destroy the one human left that can destroy us and end that bloodline once and for all. I shook my head at all of this story and asked, so, so all of this was planned? How much of it? How, how, how long have you people been trying to do me in? 
I'll get to that in a moment, but here's a secret that you'll truly enjoy. Normally, one of your blood could cause a member of our order, with an aura as dark as mine, to drop dead at a single touch. I took this into account when dealing with you. I've been nullifying your power with the one thing that'll weaken it, human flesh and blood. I went white at Lombard's statement. He began to laugh even harder. <laughs> That's right, friend. I personally slipped in a bit of human to each of your meals since you got here. You never even knew. Oh, how proud your ancestors would be of you. Little did he know I hadn't eaten in days. I flung my hand out and grabbed at Lombard's wrist. Wrenching down, I felt a texture similar to squeezing down on raw meat. The giant roared as droplets of liquefied flesh dripped onto the floor. I apparently still had some power. He roared with pain and anger, and I continued to twist and yank with my vice-like grip. I felt the crunching and oozing of now gelatinous bone pulling away from muscle. Suddenly, I jerked with all of my might and gripped onto Lombard's severed hand as the rest of him fell to the ground in a writhing heap. Lombard clenched his bloody stub. <clears throat> I see you wisened up to my trickery, clever man. <sighs> no matter, you will not leave this place alive. I'll see to that. I shouted at him, You'll never kill me, monster! As soon as I escape, I'm taking Elizabeth and getting as far away from town as we can. You'll never be able to find us. Lombard began his hoarse laughter again. You won't be safe, friend. Even when you think you're most protected, we'll be there. We'll watch you. We'll find you. We will never forget. Not even with that girl of yours are you safe. Wait till you hear the tale. <laughs> Uh, surely you noticed how your emotions distorted when you were close to her? You should know we took the liberty of turning her into a, a tool of sorts. We altered her mind to force you into awakening the ancient blood in your veins in order to drive you apart and into the arms of our circle. She was one of the most instrumental tools in our plot. <laughs> oh, she was such a naive girl. Fool. Pretty, too. I lost it. I flung myself at my captor once again, and pressing my boot into his chest, I wrapped my hands around his horns and began to pull. Lombard screamed with pain as I pulled at his mask. I felt each stitch pop as I wrenched it upward. The titan began to flail his hands and stab at my body, but every contact with my skin resulted with a feeling of a man punching a slab of molten metal. With one last ferocious pull, I felt the final stitch tear, and I flung the headdress against the wall in a splatter of blood and teeth. Lombard's body flailed, and I ran to the door. His disfigured face writhed as he cried into the air, I swear, Elm, you will never escape the hand of the Black Circle. You will die by my hand. I smirked at my handiwork. Well, we'll see, friend. I promptly sprinted down the staircase and out of the silent house. My legs ached after tussling with such a giant, but I shrugged off the pain and ran across the grass as fast as I could. As I passed by the great hall, I could hear the shrieks of terror and sorrow. I chuckled at the reaction that I'd caused. I hope I never see that thing again, I muttered. I hurried myself to the concrete shack at the edge of the property. I figured now was a good enough time as any to see if I could get into that mysterious building. Halfway through the field, I turned to see hooded men with torches beginning their search for me, and quickened my pace. I was able to reach the now unlocked door while the search party went off to investigate the barn and the tool shed. Taking advantage of my moment of safety, I slowly slid the door open and saw a rather anticlimactic sight. The room was dimly lit by a single light bulb hanging from the ceiling, several barrels around the corners and walls. 
and there was a workbench fastened to one wall next to another large metal door at the end of the room. Just as I got to investigating the room, I heard footsteps from behind that second door. My heart skipped a beat, and I had no choice but to conceal myself in one of the barrels. I slid back the lid, and I was met with a horrendous stench that caused me to gag uncontrollably. Reluctantly, I climbed into what felt like runny swamp sludge and held my breath. As soon as I did, the old man that I'd seen earlier pushed the door open and hobbled into the room holding what looked like a corpse slung over his shoulder. He approached the workbench and flung the body onto the table. To my horror, he began meticulously working at the body with an assortment of knives, cutting and slicing with surgical precision. The entrance to the room opened again and a group of hooded searchers entered and asked the old man if he'd seen a man matching my description anywhere. He insisted that he'd not, and after scanning the room for a few seconds, the men left as quickly as they'd come. I waited stiffly in the barrel, holding my breath as best I could, taking in brief sips of air and staying as quiet as possible so as not to reveal my location. Suddenly, I heard the old man mutter to himself, Oh yes, you'll cook up nicely, won't you? He let out a quiet chuckle. I gagged again, half with sickness and half with shock. Now I'd caught the man's attention. Deciding it was time for me to make a move, I silently lifted the lid of the barrel and slid my soaked form onto the dark floor. Fear gripping tight, lid in hand, I raced toward the stunned butcher and struck him on the head with the hunk of wood. He dropped to the floor with a dull thud. I snatched the blade from his hand and made a dash for the door, but not before looking at myself under the dim light. My stomach turned as I saw an entire body soaked in a heavy coating of blood and chunks of meat. It drizzled and pooled on the floor, sickening me. Holding back the urge to vomit, I nudged the door open, revealing a dark tunnel, far more organic than anything that I'd seen in quite a while. All was silent except for the drips of blood from my skin and clothes. I quickened my pace as I heard shouting from far behind me. I held my breath, ignored the looming claustrophobia, and soldiered on through the darkness. The near-endless tunnel finally opened into a small, candlelit room. It was only about twelve feet across, with an arching ceiling. I had little time to examine my surroundings, for when I entered the room I saw a hooded worshipper with his back facing me, holding what appeared to be an old hunting rifle. Though at first my heart raced as I anticipated my own death, I was stunned to realize that he was completely unaware of my presence. Seizing the moment, I lashed out at the crown of his head with my stolen weapon. The man let out a quick yelp, fell to the ground, and lay motionless as the blood pooled around his hood. I let the knife rest in his skull and snatched up the firearm. It is something I can use, I mumbled to myself as I slung it over my shoulder. On the floor, I noticed a small metal hatch. Seeing nowhere else to go, and remembering the search party on my tail, I opened it, descending the ladder it revealed. The ladder met the ground in an alcove on the shore of a small pond. Near the ladder, I found plastic tubs filled with things like shoes, backpacks, dog collars, among other things. Remembering the room with the old man and the cult's cannibalistic tendencies, the sight of all these tattered belongings was bittersweet. Grabbing one of the largest packs, I saw a pile of metallic objects out of the corner of my eye. Bikes. Bicycles. Taking a deep sigh, I picked up the newest looking one and rode off through the woods as fast as the wheels would spin into the night. After trudging onward through the woods for most of the night and subsisting off some trail mix I found in the bag I'd taken, I finally arrived at town. Needless to say, my friends and neighbors were amazed by my return and my appearance. However, I knew I could not stay and chat. Walking up to my house, Elizabeth rushed out to meet me. I didn't, didn't even look at her. I continued inside, gathered my belongings, and climbed into my car with Elizabeth chasing me the whole way asking what was wrong, where I'd been. I ignored her. She looked at me with a face of sorrow that I knew was just a mask, and when our eyes met, I could tell that she knew the answers to her questions. 
I backed out of the drive and made my way to the highway. I never saw her or the town again. I continued running. Many years passed that way. I traveled town to town, but every time they found me, they always found me. I've been running from them for years, but I doubt I'll ever escape their grasp. I have found a safe haven in this place for 12 years, but I fear that now they're drawing near once again. I'm too old to run anymore, my friend. I'm just too old now. The bartender stared in astonishment. So is that why you've been so solitary? Yes. Yeah, I... I fooled myself into thinking that the more I kept to myself, the safer that I'd be. The bartender stuttered, and, uh... You were... Uh... You're drinking the sacrifice, the liver thing. Is that why? The bartender let out a hearty laugh. <laughs> uh, yes. When they do find me, when they finally bite into my flesh, I want them to choke on it. The barkeep laughed grimly, and the old man noticed that the moon was low. He stood, dusting off his pants. I, uh... I'd best be leaving now. Sun will be here soon. It was a relief to finally share this story with someone. Thank you. The bartender smiled. It was a joy hearing it. Have, uh, have a good rest of the night, Mr. L. Robert nodded and started for the door. He took the subway home, like he had every night, coming home from the bar, shaking his hands to keep away the cold. After a short ride, he made his way into his apartment and climbed the stairs. He took a brief sigh and slowly opened his door. After hanging up his coat and scarf on the coat hanger and taking a seat in an armchair, he looked off into the darkness and something caught his eye. It was a gargantuan figure with pale green eyes watching him from the shadows of the apartment. Slowly, the shape plodded forward to reveal a grotesque face and a wicked, mangled grin. Robert Elm sat motionless as he looked up at the being. The thing spoke to him in a labored, devilish groan. Good evening, friend. If you know that there is a group of people who mean you harm, and you have their leader and chief motivator in a compromising position, it might be a good idea to finish the job. So stay scary, my wildlings, and make the most of your nights.